All right, welcome to our 2021 recap training series. Um, this is hosted by the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. I'm Rebecca Adi. I'm the Brownfield Coordinator here at LDEQ. Um, and today we're joined by Keith Horn, um, who is an expert in all things recap. So we're so grateful uh, for him to be able to share his knowledge today. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, um, we're going to say the word recap quite a bit. That stands for LDEQ's Risk Evaluation and Corrective Action Program. Um, this webinar series is designed to take uh, little sections of that and really highlight best practices related to that, um, some of the issues that we've seen in the field, um, just to help facilitate those recap investigations. Um, here is a link to the actual document that's posted on the LDEQ website. Um, and we'll make these slides available after the presentation, so you'll have that link as well. So here's our list of the trainings that um, we'll be doing as part of this recap training series. Today, we are going to um, start with Keith Horn's uh, soil sampling best practices, um, just to talk about the things he's seen in the field uh, that might need to be uh, tweaked a little bit just to make sure they're compliant with our recap regulations. Um, we also have four additional trainings coming up. Um, it is a different registration for each one of those. So if you are interested in those, make sure to uh, sign up via Zoom. And as I mentioned before, we are recording these um, and the recording and the PowerPoint will be available after the webinar um, if the technology all works out okay. Um, we are, this is our first time. So this is our trial run of providing certificates of attendance. Um, if you are an LDEQ employee, we are doing the course credit like we did for our other uh, recap training series, the internal one. Um, if you are not part of DEQ, we will be sending out certificates of attendance um, for you to be able to use in your um, accreditations. None of these, uh, none of the series is actually pre-qualified, but I understand uh, the geologists were working on that behind the scenes. Um, in order to receive course credit or a certificate of attendance, you do have to attend the majority of the webinar and answer the poll questions that we've scattered throughout the webinar. Um, and that's documented via Zoom. So you do have to be logged in to your Zoom account with your name on it uh, so that we know who it is. Um, and then the poll questions, again, you do not actually have to get them right. You just have to answer them. So we have something to document that you were seated at the seat and, and actually paying attention the whole time. All right, so questions, just a few logistics. If you have a question throughout the webinar, when we answer the polls, we'll also pause for questions. You can submit those uh, via the Q&A button. That's your best option. Um, that way we can kind of keep the questions straight, make sure that, um, that they all get answered. Um, and it also gives uh, Jennifer and Dwayne who are in the background, uh, they might be able to answer that um, behind the scenes and make sure that gets posted. You can also raise your hand and we can unmute you uh, when we do have that pause for questions. Or you can submit it through uh, chat. Uh, if you go into the chat, you should only be able to uh, send a message to all the panelists. Um, we just want to make sure that if you're asking a question, it gets uh, responded to by someone at LDEQ um, and you get the official answer. So that's why we've restricted the chat to just being able to communicate with the panelists. Okay, so with that, we're going to start our first poll question. Okay, and uh, Keith, can you see the poll? Oh, there we go. All right, so how long have you worked in the environmental field? So less than three years, three to six years, six to 10 years, or more than 10 years. And it just kind of gives us a feel for who's in our audience, um, as well as verifies you didn't just start the webinar and then walk away. All right, we got a lot of a uh, lot of folks seem to have quite a bit of experience, which is great. We've got a few more people that need to vote. We're going to give you just a few more seconds. All 
Okay. Go ahead and end the polling. All right, so uh, most of the folks, more than 10 years, um, with everybody else kind of scattered between less than three years, three to six years, and then six to 10 years. So a good breadth of experience. So it'll be interesting to get your feedback on this and, and what you've seen in the field as well. All right. All right, so today's speaker is uh, Keith Horn. Keith earned a Bachelor of Science degree in conservation at Southeastern Oklahoma University. He uh, then was awarded a Master of Science degree in biology from the University of Louisiana at Monroe. Um, following a period working for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, he began his career at LDEQ in 1992. Uh, he has 27 years of experience in site investigation and assessment and remediation and related areas. Um, he is currently serving as the senior environmental scientist in the LDEQ remediation division. Um, so that's his official bio. Um, what you really need to know that if someone has a technical question about investigations or cleanups at LDEQ, uh, most likely the response that we get is ask Keith. Uh, he is a wealth of knowledge uh, and experience, and what I really appreciate is he's always willing to share that knowledge and experience with others. So um, we are very thankful to have Keith and his breadth of knowledge with us today. And with that, Keith, I will hand it over to you. Okay, good Good morning, everyone. This is Keith Horn joining you from a secure and undisclosed location, as the old saying goes. Actually, I'm working from home today, so I can uh, do this quietly. Um, anyway, um, I appreciate everybody showing up today. Um, we're going to go over the title of the, um, the presentation today is Proper Soil Sampling Techniques. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is... Um, problems and uh, you know some new information about soil sampling. We're going to assume, especially since the poll showed that over half of you have more than 10 years of experience, that you um, have some experience in sampling soil. But uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, point out some common errors, some sloppy uh, shortcuts that people have been taking and problems that get reporting to us so that we can all do it according to the book, according to recap, because that's what's required, you know, in the VRP. When we talk about the VRP, um, we are really talking about the investigation being done by recap and the um, requirements of the VRP are the requirements of recap for the investigation phase. There's a little bit of difference when you get to a corrective action phase. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later webinars. You're allowed to do a partial remedial action if you're not a classical potentially responsible party, but uh, the investigation is purely recap. So we wanna make sure when we do a recap investigation, we do it right. So the subtitle of my presentation today is how, or how to be smarter than the dirt. Um, you know, when I went to ULM and finished up seven years of university, um, I didn't think the big part of my job would be putting dirt in jars, but you know, there we have it. That's what, that's actually what a lot of my early career consisted of. Now we put it in jars and we use Encore samplers and preserve vials and other things, but essentially that's, uh, that's what we have to do to get the analytical data to make these decisions on to determine if we've met those minimum remediation standards that uh, the VRP talks about. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is how to do it correctly. So uh, Rebecca, next slide. All right, so first we're gonna talk about the problems. I know we're gonna kind of go into problems a lot. I'm not here to you know, be negative, but you know, we see a lot of issues out in the field. You know, uh, When we first came out through CAP, I think there were a lot of people that were trained properly and that knew how to address you know, the, uh, the soil in accordance with regulation. And I think a lot of those people got promoted to uh, management positions or retired or moved to other states or whatever. And so we now have, um, you know, new people that may not be trained, that may not be fully aware of the requirements. So we get a lot of uh, feedback um, from our um, team leaders that are out there, DEQ team leaders. They're saying, hey, these people are not, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and then we have to, you know, call 
the company involved and have a, you know, come to Jesus meeting or come to Buddha or whichever and uh, discuss, uh, you know, that maybe we need to have some retraining. Maybe we need to go over this a little more. But uh, most of the problems we see are a failure to follow the requirements of recap appendix B section B2, excuse me, B252. Now, this is a section that talks about soil sampling and recaps appendix B and recaps appendix B is where it talks about site investigations. So really B252 is a fairly short section and we'll go over the pertinent parts in uh, just a moment. But one thing we need to talk about when we talk about recap, and this is a misunderstanding upon a lot of the regulated community, recap is not guidance. This isn't a, a guidance document. You know, EPA got all these interim final guidances and this guidance and that guidance. But recap is not a guidance, it's a regulation. Uh, it is mandated by LAC 33 I Chapter 13, Section 2.3. That's the Office of the Secretary's Regulations. And our current recap, which is the 2003 um, version, is a regulation. Um, and that is required by law. Uh, like I tell people, it's not just a good idea. It's the law. So we, we at DEQ are bound by recap as much as you in the regulated community are bound by recap. But uh, the good news is that if we all follow the requirements of recap, then we're all on the same page and we'll have no problems and we can proceed and we can do good work. So let's uh, go to the next slide there, Rebecca. All right, so um, let's look at this uh, recap appendix B, section B252 soil investigations. I joke that I wanted to make sure all of you have read it at least once in your career. So I wanted to go over here in the, in the uh, webinar. So this is actually the portions of this that I have uh, italicized are cut and pasted directly from the recap regulation. The underlines and the bowls are my own emphasis, but this is what the regulation requires. It says that soil samples are to be collected using a thin wall sampler, e.g. Shelby tubes, split spoon samplers, direct push samplers, other sampling tubes approved by DEQ. I think mostly nowadays we use direct push samplers, but the other ones are available. Um, soil samples shall be extruded in the field immediately following the retrieval of each sampler. And we'll talk about that a little more in just a moment. Then it says a representative portion of each soil sample shall be carefully trimmed to remove the smear zone formed during the sample acquisition and split into two portions. So each interval that you have, you first remove the smear zone that's on the outside. I have one geologist that uses a, a vegetable peeler to do that, you know, and I think that's pretty cool. But, you know, sometimes geologists knives, sometimes, you know, use uh, some type of scraping tool. But then you have the core and you split it into two portions. And then we begin to process it. So Rebecca, let's go to the next slide, please. There we go. Now we have these two portions from the previous uh, paragraph, uh, previous census. And it says one portion shall immediately be placed in a clean sample container appropriate for the method, labeled and cooled to four degrees centigrade while the other portion shall be placed in a clean 16 ounce glass container covered with clean aluminum foil and sealed. The soil in the 16 ounce glass container shall be allowed to volatilize for approximately 15 minutes prior to conducting their headspace screening analysis by penetrating the foil with probe from a flame ionization detector, a photo ionization detector, or other instrument approved by DEQ. Now, when we look at regulations, um, I don't know if y'all spend any time looking at regulations, but you have these various terms in regulations. Uh, shall, now that sounds biblical, but it means you will do it. It's not optional, it's required. That's not something that we can negotiate about. Now, if we say something like approximately or should or may, then that's something that we can, we can you know, have some flexibility on. But shall means you will do it that way. That is it, that is all. So uh, keep that in mind that this says shall in two places. So we'll talk about that more a little bit later, but just want to call attention to the shalls. Thou shalt understand shall. Okay, next. <laughs> All right, so the next uh, portion of this B252, and this is the final portion. Uh, it says, if the organic vapor analyzer is incapable of detecting the COC, which is constituent of concern. Since I cut and pasted this directly from recap, it already defined that. So again, I know this is an acronym heavy business, 
So uh, if anybody uh, has any questions about those, if we miss any of those, make sure to bring that up and we'll, we'll address it. But this particular one, constituents of concern, is what we're investigating on recap. Basically, it's a chemical compound or a metal or some other constituent, if you will. Um, so if we are incapable of detecting it due to its constituent characteristics, i.e. it's non-volatile or it's a metal, you know, a PID can't detect a metal, then alternative field screening tests or other rationale for selection of samples previously approved by DEQ shall be employed. Shall again, notice that. All samples shall be submitted with completed chain of custody forms to an accredited laboratory in accordance with LAC 33I subpart three, which is the laboratory accreditation regulations. So that is the italicized section and that is the portion of the recap regulation that covers how to take soil samples for the most part. There's a little bit more around that, but that's the key point that we want to discuss today. So, um, and it's not very much, it's a paragraph really. It's a long paragraph, man, but it's a paragraph. Now, one of the things we're talking about on this page, on this particular slide, you know, a lot of us are, are familiar with going out there with the PID, but you know, PIDs don't work if lead is my COC. I've got a site right now, I'm working with my consultants that um, do site investigations for the department and our issue is barium. So we, we could try to find an XRF or X-ray fluorescence meter to measure barium. They're usually calibrated for like lead or something. Or, you know, what we finally decide on is we're just going to sample every two foot interval because we're trying to delineate a barium hotspot. So we're just going to analyze every interval. But that's kind of the point you have to go through. You know, going out there like lemming with PID on lead site doesn't get you real good data and doesn't tell you anything because, you know, a PID is incapable of detecting lead. Now, XRF or X-ray fluorescence is a new technique. I say new, it's been around since the 90s, but I mean, it's kind of new for it to be out in the field used in field screening, but now we've got those XRF meters that they use to shoot lead paint and we can, uh, you know, we can do soil samples with them in the field. So my uh, consulting firm uh, that is under contract department has one and we're gonna be screening a lead site with it where to take samples, so that's pretty cool. Um, other things that you can use in the field, one thing I've seen recently, on a PCB side is field test kits. Um, there's immunoassay kits. A lot of these have, I don't you know, recommend any particular name brands but for ethical reasons, but you may be familiar with things like chlorine oil or other test kits that have been around for a long time or chlorine soil. And these test kits generally give you an immunoassay result and have some type of color change or other type of um, you know, visible change in the test kit if you reach a certain level of constituents. So those can be used to screen. You know, they've got some now. I was reading about PCBs, got some there for like one, 10, 25 parts per million. So you might be able to use those. Some other things that are low tech and all of us ought to be able to do is recognize staining. You know, if you're dealing with hydrocarbons, uh, you know, often if it's a heavy oily type of stuff, you're going to see dark staining in the soil. Or maybe if your constituent concern has a color or some type of you know, characteristic that you can see, then that ought to be part of your um, part of your rationale. You know, first, maybe we're going to use the PID because we have a heavy oil. But if the PID doesn't give us results, our secondary screening uh, rationale would be staining. Uh, another thing that's good with hydrocarbon is sheen. Sheen is, you know, that oily kind of uh, film that you see on top of water or Sometimes on your soil tube, if you see some of that in your wet soils, then you could uh, deal with that. Another one, of course, is odor. Now, you have to be careful with odor. I remember when we were looking at the DNR 29B emergency regulations back during the Foster administration, they had proposed a smell test for oil field waste. And a lot of us were kind of concerned at that public meeting. I think one of the doctors expressed it best that, you know, one of your constituents here concern is benzene. So you can't be sniffing benzene because then you're exposing your worker to at levels that are exceeding, you know, OSHA requirements. So if you're dealing with something with odor, you know, you have to use something that has a good odor threshold. Creosote is a good example because low levels of creosote can be, um, you know, very uh, odiferous, but uh, they don't get up to levels of volatiles that can harm you. So maybe creosote, although I don't, you know, suggest you put your snaz on the creosote soil and snort either. But, uh, you know, if, if that's um, some distance away and low enough concentration, maybe so. Uh, fate and transport is another one. If you have knowledge, like with PCBs, you pour PCBs on the surface of the ground, you know, they're generally still on the surface of the ground. They're big, heavy molecules that don't move very much 
They're not water soluble, so they tend to stay where they're put. Uh, eln apples, on the other hand, especially light in eln apples, uh, tend to migrate and tend to end up right on the soil groundwater interface. So, you know, you want to you know, use what you know about the compounds that you expect to be there, perhaps as your alternative rationale. So these are all great things to use under different conditions. And we, we probably need to start thinking more about these things. You know, like I say, PIDs are good for what they're good for. And that's things that have volatile or semi-volatile fractions, but they're not very good for anything else. You know, fortunately, a lot of times we are looking at eld apples, particularly those of you that live in the UST world. So uh, PIDs and FIDs are pretty good, but uh, when you're chasing something else, you have to get creative. So next slide, please, Rebecca. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the specific problems in relation to recap Appendix B, Section B252. One thing it says is that soil cores are to be processed immediately following retrieval of each sampler. I think most of us now uh, are using, you know, geoprobe type direct push technology and you get a, you know, say a four foot tube come out of the ground, here's the drillers, and they bring it over to the geologist and or engineers uh, there at the sample table as soon as they pull out of the ground. That's good. That's good technique. Now, the, then the driller goes back to a hole and they should wait at that point till the geologist, uh, engineers, or the sampling personnel have processed the previous soil core. You know, they've got to scrape that um, smear layer off, they've got to split in two sections, they've got to take their analytical samples, they have to take their uh, field screening samples, put those in the 16 ounce glass jars, cover them with soil. And then when that's done, then the, G the drillers can push another four foot section. You know, they could go ahead and get the rig ready to push that section, but they should not have more than one soil core out of the ground at one time. Now I have seen it where drillers start stack these cores up by the sampling table. And if I see that, I tell them to shut this down, that this is not acceptable because it is to be processed immediately or following retrieval each summer. Someone asked me one time, well, how long is immediately? And I said, right now, dang it. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what immediately means. As soon as practically possible you know you can't leave it lay in the sun for half an hour that's not immediately so that's a problem we see it's easily resolved by having your soil sampling personnel and your drillers develop a symbol uh you know i have one jaws that whistles at the drillers and waves his hand you know and that's the symbol you know we want everybody to be done at the same time so that the, dr the drillers and the geologists and the engineers and sampling personnel can all go to lunch at the same time, you know? We want them to be, uh, you know, socially, uh, you know, together. So anyway, so let's go on to the next slide, Rebecca. All right, here's a poll question. Rebecca, back to you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. There we go. Um, so our first poll question of the actual content, when should drillers acquire the next core? Uh, this is multiple choice, so you can choose as many options as you would like. Um, as soon as they can, so they can get done faster. Uh, once geologists and or sampling personnel have processed the previous core or whenever they feel like getting around to it. Um, so go ahead and, and submit your vote. Um, again, in order to get that certificate of completion, you do have to actually um, answer the poll questions. Um, so please reply to each one of the polls. All right, we have 84% of the folks have voted. Um, go ahead and get those votes in. You got about 10 more seconds left. All right, we're up to 88%. Okay, you got five more seconds left and then we're gonna close the poll. All right. All right, most of you uh, responded correctly. Once the geologist and or sampling personnel have processed the previous soil core. As Keith mentioned, it's really important that they don't get ahead of the uh, geologist. Oh, oops. Let me share those results. All right. Any questions? I don't see any in the Q&A or the chat for right now. So Keith, I am going to go ahead and pass it back to you. Okay, thank you. This is uh, our next discussion of specific problems 
And uh, so let's talk about this one. Um, when we do what Recap B25 so, to says, um, you know, where we do these immediate processing of each um, soil core and we sample each interval and put it in analytical containers, then that process has been the same throughout Recap, all the way back to the original uh, black book. It was supposed to be green, but it turned out so dark, it, was, uh, it turned out to be black, the first Recap. All that is called continuous sampling. So when we make a, um, a soil boring and we take samples from each interval as we make the boring, that's continuous sampling. Now, one of the problems, of course, we see is that continuous sampling is not being conducted as Recap requires. That's kind of a issue that we, uh, you know, have. Um, one of the things that we read in section B252, the regulatory requirement is that sample containers appropriate for the method are to be filled. That's a quote, by the way, because it's in uh, italics. Are to be filled first from each and every interval labeled and chilled. Then you can field screen the aliquots. Now that is a French word that I wanted to bring up since we're all in Louisiana, I think y'all all know French, but this is a word they use in chemistry to mean sort of a subsample or a portion of a whole. So when we have that core and we split it in half, you have your analytical aliquot, which is the one you put in your sample containers appropriate for the method. Then you have the other aliquot that you put in the field screening jar so that you can allow it to go for 15 minutes and then stick your PID through the foil to see if there's volatiles or semi-volatiles that have been emitted from it. So first, we put them in sample containers. Now, when I started this business, uh, sample containers appropriate for the method for volatiles were a four ounce glass jar, you know, with the Teflon liner and all that. Um, then, um, you know, in the late 90s, and uh, we began doing the early 2000s, that was replaced by the Encore sampler and preserve vials for EPA method 5035, which we should all be familiar with. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But regardless, recap hasn't changed. From the moment you achieve that soil core and remove the smear layer, the first thing you do is you fill your encores, your preserve vials, or you know, if you're doing semi-volatiles, maybe an eight ounce jar, whatever sample containers are appropriate for the analytical methods that you're going to run. You fill those first from each and every interval. So each two foot section, you fill your sample containers. That's the way it is. Then you do field screening to determine which of these analytical containers that you have in your cooler on ice at four degrees C, you know, you're going to actually analyze. So that uses up a lot of sample containers, but that is the price of getting, you know, accurate data. Now, one thing we see in the field is people want to store the soil core for an analysis, whether they put it in a Ziploc bag and throw it in a cooler, or they leave it laying on the ground or whatever else, they want to do that to save containers. They don't want to spend money to use a bunch of encores that they don't um, analyze. But that is, uh, that is not continuous sampling. It's not allowed by RECAP. Uh, RECAP says you're going to fill the sample containers appropriate from the method first and then field screen. And this is, again, all the way back to the very first version of RECAP. It has never, never been allowed under RECAP. So, you know, that's, you know, if you've been doing it that way for a long time, then you've been doing it wrong, guys. You know, you're not doing the proper uh, investigation. And, you know, one of the things EPA found in their research and leading the EPA method 5035, as soon as soil is exposed to air, bacteria begin breaking down the volatiles. Maybe they were limited by the present lack of oxygen and we oxygenate it, they begin to eat. Uh, it's what they needed to do their metabolic process. The other thing is volatiles volatilize. As soon as you expose them to the air, especially here in Louisiana, you got a 90 degree day, you know, these things are just going to come out of the soil. Uh, EPA suggests that obtaining your analytical sample within 10 seconds of exposing that soil core is a desirable goal. So, you know, we can't leave these things laying on the ground in the 90 degree heat while we do 15 minutes of screening over here to decide where we're going to take that sample. That's just not going to give us good results. And it's going to result in you not having data, data that could be an order of magnitude below the actual levels. And, you know, when we're using risk-based standards, we're talking about benzene, which causes childhood leukemia, you know, we need to make sure that we measure 
these compounds correctly. We sometimes get blase about this stuff, but some of these compounds we deal with are really bad. And, you know, we're trying to protect those workers and those residents. They're going to be on the sites in the future. And to do that, we've got to measure this stuff accurately as we can. So, all right, next slide. Okay, before we go to the next slide, we did have a question that came okay. in. Um, if you are sampling for non-volatiles, is it still necessary to put the driller on hold until after each core is, is processed? If so, why? The, re uh, the simple answer is the, the regulation does not specify that it's volatiles. Okay. The regulation is the same for all compounds that you fill each interval, each jar. If you're doing a lead site, theoretically, um, you know, if you're following recap appendix B, you fill, you fill a jar from every interval and then you screen with the XRF to see what you're going to analyze. Now, in a practical matter, non-volatiles, which we were talking only about metals because semi-volatiles are volatiles. They're only semi-volatile, right? Especially if you're dealing with some of the high-end semi-volatiles, they're light compounds like naphthalene. See, these are going to volatilize just like your volatiles do. Now, some of the heavy-end semi-volatiles may not do so much of a volatilization, but you know, you don't really know what you're having your sample to analyze it. See, I think you have to treat it like it, it could volatilize. Now, if you had only a metal site, you know, and we have no volatile compounds whatsoever. Um, you could write a work plan that, you know, addresses the fact that there aren't any volatiles, that you're going to leave the cores laying around because, you know, lead doesn't, doesn't degrade. It's an element, uh, you know, barring nuclear uh, forces, which we hope are not present at your site. It's going to remain the same till, you know, the sun blows up in five billion years. So, um, that is, you know, something you could write into a work plan that you're going to acquire the cores, you know, screen them with XRF for lead, and then you'll take your samples. And if we approve it, then that would be an exception to the recap regulation. But the recap regulation does not make any, you know, special uh, category for metals or non-volatiles. It says you should handle all samples the same way. So, and the way we just discussed, so, you know, I guess you could get a, a work plan that says differently, but uh, the the um, recap reg says you will immediately fill them, and that's that's what you got to do unless you have uh, approval to do otherwise. Okay, Rebecca, right. anything else? Uh, yeah, we have two more questions that came. Okay. Um, can I wrap cores in foil and place in Ziploc bag and then place on ice while I wait for field screening results to determine which samples I want to submit to the lab? This is no volatile that, and volatile constituents. Yeah. No, that has never been allowed under RECAP. RECAP says you are to immediately place the um, section into the container appropriate for the method. You may not store cores for any period of time under any circumstances, whether it's wrapped in foil and put in a bag or whatever else, that is not allowed by the regulation. It has never been allowed by the regulation. No. <laughs> okay. okay. And right. uh, this next one, I think you are actually going to address on this next Okay. One. Um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna an ask it just so you know it is collecting recap okay. intervals, soil groundwater interface, bottom of boring immediately and then doing co-located boring for highest PID if necessary. Yeah, okay, yeah, we are gonna talk about so that. So I think so that's, that's what, the, yeah. your slide is up uh, and okay. I'll talk about co-located boring. Uh, okay. And for Ashlyn, just uh, re-ask your question if we didn't quite answer it at the, uh, Keith goes over this information. Okay, all right, so we'll go ahead and talk about co-located borings. This is something, that has come about uh, discussion and we have approved it as a matter of policy, um, but it is not included in the recap regulation and we'll discuss that in a minute. Uh, but what is an alternative to continuous sampling? Uh, the we have this approach called the co-located boring approach It's described in our uh, EPA method 5035 FAQs. Um, but what is it? Okay, a co-located boring is where you make your initial boring um, and you collect your mandatory sample intervals, uh, then you screen the rest of boring. Now, the mandatory sample intervals, you know, one termination of boring is always a mandatory sample interval required by recap. So you would always collect that. 
Then if it is an LNAPL that you're chasing, then the soil groundwater interface is a mandatory sample interval and you, you will have to collect that. And so as soon as you encounter it, you collect it, no questions asked because you gotta have it. Same with the termination. Then um, let's say you have a surface spill. Of course, recap says that if you have a surface discharge, the surface is mandatory interval. So again, that is, uh, you know, that's what you would do on your first boring. Then you would take, um, and screen the rest of the boring to get your highest PID. Now, the PID may show you that, hey, that soil ground wire interface I've already collected is my highest PID. If so, Yahtzee, you know, great, I'm good. You know, I, I don't have to make another boring, all right? Um, but let's say that the interval above the soil ground wire interface was the highest PID, not the soil ground wire interface I already collected. I still have to collect soil water ground water interface because it's mandatory, but now the PID says I need to collect the two foot interval above the soil ground water interface. So I would tell my driller, you know, hey driller, blow and go down to, you know, whatever depth that is and bring me that too, right? So from the serial screen results of first boring, you can make a second co-located boring to collect the samples indicated by the field screen results. So Ashley or Ashley, I hope that was what you were talking about. Next slide, please. Now, co-located borings, um, you know, there are certain people who will tell you that these are a bad idea. Um, in fact, the maker of the Encore Sampler, Innovative Technology, tells you that these are a bad idea. Because, you know, we all know that soil is very heterogeneous. It's, uh, it's not like water, you know, things don't distribute through it as evenly and all that kind of stuff as as it does in other matrices, you know, when we get, you know, 50% uh, differences in our duplicate samples in soil, we kind of go, well, yeah, it's soil. Um, so one of the things that we should consider for doing a co-located boring, uh, we should only do a co-located boring if we feel that the contaminant concentration should be at equilibrium between these immediately adjacent boring locations. Uh, like if we're talking about an old UST release, you know, the stuff has migrated through the soil. It should be at, you know, equilibrium now or at least close to it. It's not going to be really different between two borings, four inches apart. You know, we want to put these borings horizontally, um, you know, and make them perpendicular to the source so that they should both be at the same level of concentration. Um, so, you know, we, we wouldn't want to do collective borings possibly on a fresh spill because, you know, that may, may not be at equilibrium. Um, you know, if we have very, very heterogeneous soil types, you know, a riverine thing where two borings next to each other can be geologically completely different, you would not want to really, you know, consider co-located borings because you could have great differences in, you know, contaminant distribution between those two. So, you know, kind of use your smarts and talk to your geologists before you propose this. But one thing I do have to say is that colloquial borings, if we're doing recap, they have to be proposed and approved by DEQ as they are not currently covered in recap appendix B. So if we're doing recap, right, um, you know, we're doing a recap investigation, you need to either do continuous sampling, like we talked about, or if you want to do colloquial borings, you have to put that in your work plan and get that signed off on because recap appendix B, section B252, which is the law, it's the regulation, doesn't cover them. You have to uh, propose and get that approved. Now, um, where could you do co-located borings um, on your own? You know, not all of you are doing recap all the time. Some of you do these phase twos or whatever. You know, if you do a co-located boring on a phase two um, to save money on all those sample containers because, you know, those phase two, uh, clients, they're, they're all looking for the low price, you know, well, if it makes sense to do it that way, good, you know, you, you really still wanted at least that can say you can do co-located boring. So later we might be able to use your data and recap if you do find a release, which a lot of phase twos find releases and you end up in recap. And if you don't follow the recap procedures in your phase two, then, you know, you have data that you end up can't use. And we'll discuss that a little bit more in a minute. But I hope that answered people's questions on the co-located boring. Next slide, Rebecca. Okay, one thing I do need to say, I saw Tad was on the call today and I don't want to offend my uh, brethren in the UST world, but we have to tell you that co-located borings 
are not allowed for reimbursement under the Motor Fuels Underground Storage Tank Trust Fund. That's the must off or the UST Trust Fund is another thing that that gets called. We do not allow these under that. Uh, on UST Trust Fund sites, continuous sampling is required and it's reimbursable by a trust fund if you meet all your other requirements of eligibility. So the trust fund, and maybe you are too, it just kind of, you know, does co-locate okay borings make sense for you under your situation? One thing you have to consider is um, how do you pay your drillers? You know, the trust fund pays for borings by the foot, okay? Uh, I have a contract where I pay for borings by the foot. So, you know, if that's the case, it may not make any sense to make second borings to get PID intervals, you know, to try to save on analytical, you know, um, sample containers. If I'm saving $30 in Encore, but I'm spending $46 a foot to save $30 in Encore, am I doing any good there? You know, it just doesn't make sense. Now, if you're paying your drillers by the day or by, you know, some other, um, some other means, you know, um, then it might make sense. So you got to run the numbers on that to see if co-locating borings make sense for you. Sometimes the sample containers are cheaper, particularly if you're just looking for semi-volatiles because, you know, an eight ounce glass jar is cheap. But anyway, you got to run those numbers on your own and find out if it financially makes sense. Okay, Rebecca, next slide. Okay. Oh, back. We skipped one. We've got a poll. Yep, there you are. Okay, uh, our next poll. Just to reiterate, are co-located borings allowed for reimbursement under the Motor Fuels UST Trust Fund? So your answer choice is yes, no, only under special conditions. All right, we got half of y'all voted. There we go. All right, we're up to almost 80%. 84, we're keeping up there. We need a few more of you to vote just to make sure. Again, uh, we're not checking to make sure you get the right answer on these. We're just using these to verify that you were in attendance today. Um, so if you are not sure, please go ahead and vote for something. Um, and we just want to make sure that you're understanding the, the content as well, just to reiterate the, yeah. the points of this. Yeah. It's All right, not so like we're asking very, very difficult questions here. Either. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a pass or fail situation. Either. Okay. All right. So uh, there's a few more left. You've got about 10 more seconds to place your vote. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and close it. All right. I don't really see anybody else coming in. All right, we're going to go ahead and end the polling uh, and share the results. All right, so Keith, what's our right answer? Uh, no, the Motor Fuels Trust Fund uh, does not allow that because they pay by the foot. So please conduct mm -hmm. continuous sampling uh, if you're doing Motor Fuels Trust Fund work. All right. Okay. Take those. And. All right. So let's go on to more specific problems. Um, back, you know, we're still working on that B252 paragraph that uh, we have all went over now. But per the recap regulation, and I want to re reinstate that, I always refer to it in all my letters and anything else as recap regulation so people understand. Um, 16 ounce glass jars are required for the field screening of soil aliquots. And the reason for this is that 16 ounce glass jars have consistent headspace. Now I would also state that 16 ounce glass jars are available at all your local grocery stores in the canning section. You know, you can use Ball, Kerr, Golden Harvest, whatever brand suits you. It doesn't have to be a laboratory container. This is for the field screen. So it doesn't have to be critically clean. The other thing is 16 ounce glass jars can be decontaminated in the field as long as you get them clean enough that your PID reads zero on them, then you're good. You can put new soil in them or reuse them. The other thing about 16 ounce glass jars is they're reusable and they're recyclable. So it's greener choice. We always want to make those little green choices in our life. Now I know one consultant that actually bought a commercial dishwasher for his office. So he brings back his 16 ounce jars, runs them through his commercial dishwasher and has them all sparkling squeaky clean for his next 
um, you know, field mobilization. Now, it's not necessary exactly, but it sure is nice. But uh, anyway, so the use of these 16 ounce glass jars is based on research conducted by EPA uh, under their UST program, which was incorporated into our DEQ's former UST site investigation guidance. And it was later incorporated into RECAP Appendix B when RECAP was promulgated. So uh, the, the little secret is that RECAP Appendix B mostly came from that UST side investigation guidance because they had one. It was great. And we brought it into RECAP. So here's what uh, this is going to be a shocker for y'all, but field screening using plastic bags uh, like Ziplocs or Hefty or whatever other brand has never been allowed under RECAP. Um, that is not allowed. And whenever I see it in the field, I tell them, well, you need to go over to the grocery store and get you some 16 ounce glass jars. Now it's not 32 ounce glass jars. That's not eight ounce glass jars. EPA's research said 16 ounce was the optimal size. They, uh, EPA's research also found that Ziplocs did not give a consistent headspace. And so that was, they didn't give, you know, reproducible results. So that is uh, the rule. 16 ounce jars, guys, no Ziplocs, no field screening from plastic bags. And that goes back to the original version of recap. So nope, can't do it, not allowed. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this is a little demonstration I did in one of our recap corrective action group meetings to illustrate this point. Yeah, I'm on the corrective action group too. I'm a glutton for punishment. But anyway, these are the same 16 ounce bags, not 16 ounce, quart bags, I'm sorry, from the same package of you know plastic bags that we had laying around the office. And I have taken these bags and inflated them to various different levels. Now, which of these bags is gonna have the most headspace? Well, obviously the one on the right of the screen. See, it looks like a little pillow, you know, whereas the one on the left of the screen has virtually no air in it. But uh, if I put the same soil in the one on the right and the one on the left, they give me vastly different headspace screening results because there's more headspace in the right one to dissolve the volatiles in. Um, so that's why plastic bags are not in recap and are not allowed under the recap regulation because they don't give you a consistent headspace. All right. Here we have a poll question. All right, so I'm gonna admit this poll is just to make sure that we reiterate this point over and over because this is something that I've seen in the field as well. Um, so what containers should be used for field screening? So, and it is multiple choice, uh, Ziploc bags, flat four ounce glass jars, 16 ounce glass jars, or any container will work as long as you use the same type of container for all screening samples. Um, all right, we've got 83 <laughs> perfect. Y'all are perfect so far. Um, we're gonna give the rest of you just a few more seconds uh, to reply. Again, just go ahead, make sure that you're answering if you want that uh, a certificate of attendance or credit, we just need you to make sure you're answering the question. So even if you are not sure what the right answer is, um, go ahead and, and answer it within the next 10 seconds and then we'll close it off so we can move on. Um, and Keith, while people are, are, um, are answering, we did have a question that came in. Okay. Is the minimum and maximum distance recommended for co-located borings to avoid outgassing of volatiles from the adjacent borehole? Well, um, you know, we because we're kind of in our own um, thing here. Most people don't recognize uh, co-located borings is a good thing to do at all. Um, but uh, you know, you probably want to give it for you know, I you know, one thing is you can't really get a geopro boring that close to the next one very successfully. So, you know, four inches is one goal, I guess, you know, but six inches would be a little bit better, but I wouldn't try to go any over six inches, maybe eight inches if you had to. It's as close as practical, um, you know, cause you want the geology to be the same and you want the contaminant distribution to be the same. So, you know, but yeah, if you could put it like an inch away, I wouldn't because, you know, there could be off gassing into the, the first borehole from the soil in the second one, so. Okay, and then we have one more question come in. Okay. How much soil should be put into the 16 ounce jar for a PID reading? 
That's a good, uh, good point there. Um, you know, it talks about half of the soil from the interval in recap appendix B, section B252. So it says half gets put in antelope cooked containers, half gets put in there. But, you know, it, you want to have headspace in the jar so you don't want to fill the jar up with dirt. Uh, you know, you do want to take an equal amount of soil from whatever your interval is. So if it's like, you know, two foot interval, you know, you, you want to, you know, include all that two foot. One thing you don't want to do is you don't want to include that smear layer. I've seen people cut off that smear layer, then try to throw it in jars. And that's not a good practice because that smear layer could come from somewhere else earlier up in the boring. You know, if you push through some high concentration soil and now you're below it, you don't want to put that in your jar. You want something more closer to the center of that core. So, you know, that's one thing to consider. Don't use your smear layer. But as long as you put a consistent amount of soil in all your jars, and I'm not asking you to, you know, put it on a scale, weigh it or something like, you know, eyeball it. Don't put, you know, half a jar in one jar and, you know, one dirt clot on the bottom in the next jar. You know, again, this is a field screening. It's a relative measure. So let's try to, you know, be somewhat consistent. You know, it's like a professor of mine said, in this case, precision is more important than accuracy. Precision is making the same mistake the same way every time. You know, that's, but anyway, it's a chemist for you. I think we have some more questions there, huh? Uh, those are the only two that I Okay. See. Okay, good. Right. I'm going to end All the right. polling. Uh, most of you uh, did respond correctly in the 16 glass jars. That's the only container that should be used for screen, for uh, field screening. All right. Stop. All right, Keith, back to you. All right. So we're still talking about specific problems in this uh, field soil sampling. I promise we will get through the problems at some point. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about some problems we see with the application of EPA method 5035, which is, you know, the EPA method that in Louisiana became mandatory in 2002. I think it was July, if I remember right. And it's mandatory in Texas even now. It only took them till like a couple of years ago to make it mandatory in Texas. But it's, uh, I think it's pretty much across the board. You know, we just don't put volatile samples in four ounce jars anymore. That's called a bulk sample and we don't do it. So what are your other choices? Well, you have things like the Encore sampler and another sampler we'll talk about in a little bit, or you can do field preservation of vials. Some people talk about this being a TerraCore method or lock and load method. And those are the names of various samplers. They're designed to put soil in vials. It's not the name of the sampling method. Uh, we call it a preserved vial option under EPA method 5035. This is where you have your vials in the field that have methanol and sodium bisulfate in them. And you put your soil in the vial in the field and then you seal it up and it goes to a lab. And if you do that, you get a 14 day hold, which is nice. You know, you keep it on ice for 14 days, which I don't really recommend. It's kind of, but if you got a sample over a weekend, it's great because you know, those encores have like 48 hours to extract and your laboratory is gonna be really angry with you if you show up late Friday or ask them to show up on a Saturday and extract your encores. You know, I don't know what your relationship with your lab is, but mine would be very angry with me, but, uh, or just tell me to go to heck. But anyway, so um, preserved vials are a viable method and very useful, but we have to do it right, okay? Now, other methods that involve preserved vials that we see in the field we use under recap are the MDEP, which is the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protections, VPH method, that's the volatile petroleum hydrocarbons method, or our Texas methods 1005 and 1006. Um, when we do these methods, we need to use a field balance in the field to check the vial weights and the weight of the soil aliquots. And this is required by DEQ policy. We have it on our uh, FAQs, and it's also included in EPA guidance. In EPA's 1997 clarification of EPA method 5035, it states sample vials are weighed in the field before use. And the weight checks, it corrects an error that the weight checks were supposed to be a hundredth of a gram. They only have to be a tenth of a gram. And this EPA 1997 clarification is available on EPA's Clue In website. If you're not familiar with EPA's Clue In website, you should go become familiar with it because it's an awesome resource. It has all kinds of EPA guidance. There's all kinds of training available. 
and it's just a great clearinghouse for information on technical matters. So, yeah, if I don't give anything else worthwhile today, clue in. It's it's a take home message. All right, Rebecca. All right. So why do you need to use a field balance with preserved vial sampling in the field? Well, we have a lot of experience with EPA method 5035. We actually pioneered it for the Superfund program in Louisiana, uh, actually at the Everwood, what's today a Superfund site, but then was a, a Superfund assessment. But, uh, oh boy, it was tough. But anyway, we have some, a lot of experience with 5035 in Louisiana, and we're a lot different than other states, uh, not just in our culture and our food, but in our climate and our geology. Uh, one thing, you know, our hot conditions um, you know, you have a methanol vial prepared by a laboratory. It's supposed to have a certain amount, five milliliters of methanol, 10 milliliters, depending on the thing. And if you keep that vial around for a while, even in an air conditioned storage, we find that the methanol evaporates, that your amount of methanol in the vial and the vial's tear weight is no longer correct after a period of time. So you have to do a weight check to verify that vial is still have the correct amount of methanol in it. That's the first weight check you need to do in the field. Then uh, we need to talk about our soils. We have these heavy clay organic soils that are heavier than the places that they used uh, to develop things like TerraCore or the ESS lock and load sampler that you use to fill these preserve vials. If you use these in Louisiana with our heavy clays, you're almost always going to collect larger or heavier aliquots than the 4.5 to 5.5 grams they're allowed by these various methods. You're supposed to put five grams in five milliliters. So first you gotta make sure you still have the five milliliters. You can do that by weight, and then you can do the 4.5 to 5.5 grams by weight. Now, here's you some free knowledge that I think is, makes this a lot easier. Um, if you take your TerraCore or your ESS lock and load or cutoff syringe or whatever you're using to get, gain your five gram aliquot, if you put that on your field balance and you tear it out, you know, tear button, that eliminates the weight of that Encore, I mean, excuse me, TerraCore or lock and load or whatever sampler you're using. Then you can stick it in the dirt and stick it back on the balance and it tells you what the weight of the dirt in that sampler is. So that's why I always recommend is do that. Don't do math in your head in the sun. You know, it, it's not as fun, but uh, just tear that out. Then you know what your soil weight is. Then you pop it. If it's 4.5 to 5.5 grams, pop it right in that vial. You're good. You can, you can proceed. But what you're going to find is you probably got 5.7. You got six. You may even have seven grams of soil in that TerraCore lock and load. If so, uh, extrude a little bit of that. Cut it off with your geologist knife there or some type of you know, spatula or whatever. Um, sample scoop and then put it back on that scale. Is it now 5.5 or 4.5, 5.5? If so, Yahtzee, pop it in the vial. If it's not, take off another little bit. And that's, uh, it's, it's easier to demonstrate than to tell you over the thing, but that's what I recommend. That's what we found works best. All right. Now, another thing, Dwayne made sure I put this in here because uh, it is an important point. Uh, methanol vials. These methanol vials should not be left open on your table while you're weighing and doing this other stuff because methanol can evaporate. It's very volatile on its own. You got that 95 degree day, the methanol is gonna be evaporating out of that vial. Your five milliliters is gonna be 4.5 before you know it. Now, the other thing is if you, we have a lot of humidity in Louisiana, you might be aware of that, you know, uh, but methanol is hydrophilic and that's a big fancy word that means it loves water. It's going to start sucking water out of the air. If you have this 95% humidity that we see sometimes and you open that methanol vial, that methanol vial is going to put the slurp on the water in the air and it's going to start getting heavier. Now, I know that doesn't make much sense to you, but yes, it can happen. And the methanol will get more dilute and then you won't have that 4.5 to 5.5. Now, why do we care? Well, the, cal the calculation of concentration is based on having a known weight of soil and a known weight of methanol. And if you don't check these things, then you're going to get really weird results that you can't explain. So, all right, next slide, please. Now, here are some guys with MPC services up at the uh, Petro Processor Superfund site, and they're collecting some soil samples using a 5035 preserved vial option. 
Now we see the thing in the guy's hand there. That's an engineer, by the way. Uh, that is the lock and load sampler from ESS Vile. And Rebecca is drawing a little circle around that. Now he's using that field balance, which is on the table in the back. See the yellow thing? He has teared out the weight of that and he has put it on there to make sure he's got the five. 4.5 to 5.5 grams it's allowed now you see this box of vials down here on the chair these are ess vials uh, which is a one of the brands of volatile vials for 5035 that you can buy and he has taken all those vials and weight checked them on that scale before they started sampling and made sure they all were within you know one tenth of a gram of the correct weight because if they were not he was not going to use them for sample acquisition he was going to use send them back to be properly disposed of by the lab. Now you see this nice environment that they're sitting in using their discarded office chairs and all. This is a little trailer that they have that they pulled out there so that they could set up and take their data on the computer. You see that in the background and that they can um, you know, run their field balance and everything else on. Now, working inside a trailer is uh, great. It protects you from the wind. One of the things that you're going to find with EPA method 5035 and preserve vials is that fuel balance is going to fluctuate if there's wind on it. You know, that's just the nature of the beast. So try to block the wind from it. If you can, get in a trailer. If you can't get in a trailer, maybe open up the back of that, you know, giant SUV you drove to the site and work in the back of that where you got the, the sides and the roof to protect you from, you know, three sides that are and the top or whatever and if you can't do that if you're out on the table and you can't do anything else you can put that balance down in an empty ice chest so you'll have some protective walls around it to protect the you know prevent the wind from blowing on you so this is some guys using the preserve vial method correctly there we go all right thank you rebecca next slide please Got put up a racer. There we are. All right. So enough of that. Let's talk about some other issues. Um, QAQC is always a big issue. Um, now, quality assurance, quality control. For those of you who aren't necessarily aware of those terms, there's field quality assurance, quality control, laboratory quality assurance, quality control. Um, there's you know um, all kinds of, and there's data quality assurance, quality control. But you know you're a field sampler, so let's talk about the field part of it at this time. Uh, recap section 2.4 uh, is up in the beginning of the recap document and it discusses QAQC. It requires that you collect uh, field quality assurance, quality control samples to be collected and analyzed, it says, for routine sampling events. So if you're conducting a routine sampling event, whether that's a site investigation, a, a you know, groundwater monitoring event or anything else that's planned, and you intend to use the data in recap, you have to collect and analyze QAQC samples. And it includes a list of those samples in recap section 2.4. You have your field blanks, you have your trip blanks, you know, you have your duplicates, you have your matrix spike, matrix spike duplicates. You may all be familiar with that. But one of the things that we see problems with is that matrix spike, matrix spike duplicate samples are supposed to be, and it says in section 2.4, they are supposed to be from the site. Now I know a lot of laboratories to do their laboratory QAQC have to run like one in 20 samples through an MSMSD. And they say, oh, well, we'll report our MSD to you, MSMSD to you and save you some money on analysis. Well, that's not what recap requires and it may not be a good idea. Let me tell you why. Let's say that your site is all sandy and doesn't have a bunch of organic matter. And it's uh, if you took your MSMSD from your site, you would get really good percent recoveries from that sandy soil that didn't have the organic matter. You probably get within you know, the allowable ranges and your data would uh, not receive a quality assurance, quality control flag, like a J flag for estimated data. Um, but let's say the laboratory takes a sample from somebody else's site that is just one nasty matrix uh, contaminated with oil, it's full of organics, and it's heavy clay. Well, they're likely to get a MSMSD recovery from that sample that is low, 
And then that MSMSD result gets applied to the sample batch that it's from and your samples are in that batch. Now your samples have a qualifier that they don't deserve. Um, likewise, you know, if you have really good, I mean, if you have that really heavy clay soil with organics, you want to know that our recovery is bad and that we are underestimating. And so we can deal with that in our assessment of the risk. We don't want to get that sample that says, yeah, this is all great data when it's not. Um, we want to really know what our soil from our site is going to give us. So that's why it's important to do the MSMSD from the site. Um, one other thing about QAQC, um, what does the recap tell us if we do not have Q QAQC? It's in section 2.5 of recap, um, but it tells us that data of unknown quality can only be used in the conceptual site model. So if you don't take QAQC samples, trying to cut those corners, say on your phase two or whatever, then that data may not be admissible to recap. And when you're trying to do your recap um, you know, investigation, you may have to resample that. I can tell you a story about a guy that tried to save money. He was doing a great big phase two on a city property in Lake Charles. And he spent somewhere around 70 some thousand dollars on analysis. And he took no QAQC samples at all. Well, we tried every way we could to be able to use that data, but the laboratory just couldn't come up with enough QAQC. And in the end of the day, we had to resample all of it in order to get a data set that was admissible to recap that we could actually use to define standards. So yeah, saving money sometimes can be a really expensive process. So I would advise you do QAQC. If, you, if you're drawing a phase two or somewhere where your clients don't want to pay for that, advise them in advance that their data is not going to be admissible for anything except to show a release and to plan how to retake those samples later. You know, best you can do. All right. So Rebecca, next slide. Or do we okay. have questions? Uh, before we move on, I just wanted to make one note of this. Um, if you are, uh, if the, the recap investigation you're doing is being paid for by Brownfield's funding, um, just note this sampling should be in included in your quality assurance project plan um, and noted in there. And then obviously make sure all your field personnel um, know that that is, that is required. So, uh, and just for clarification, because we receive this a lot, like what's the difference between a Brownfields investigation and a recap investigation. Uh, Brownfields is just funding. That's all that it is. It's the same rules apply. If you're doing a recap investigation, you have to follow all these rules that um, and regulations that Keith is going over. So, um, but if you are do, using Brownfield funding, EPA requires that you do a quality assurance project plan. And in that plan, you would incorporate in the sampling and make sure that it's noted um, if you are doing a recap investigation. Um, and we did have one question that came in. Um, I've worked in a research laboratory and analyzed samples, and we always did the MS MSD on the samples we were analyzing. Is that not mm -hmm. typical for laboratories to do the MS MSD utilizing the same sample set that is being analyzed? And I'm glad you asked that because that was my experience as well, but Keith, yeah. No. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, the lab QAQC, they're going to, have to analyze one in 20. But recap says for your recap data set, your MSMSD has to be from the site. So you can't use that laboratory QAQC in relation to your site. I mean, you use it for your laboratory QAQC, but your field QAQC, you need to specify that, hey, I've collected additional volume for MSMSD. I'm designating this sample as the MSMSD, and you need to analyze it. And guess what? You're going to pay for it. But that's okay because that's the price of good data. So anyway, yeah, but the lab is going to do one every so often. That's the problem. They try to tell you, hey, we'll result our results to you and save you some money. And well, like I said, you know, their MSMSD may not be characteristic of your site conditions and the recap regulation doesn't allow it. So there you go. All right. So having answered that, we'll move on. We talked a well, little we bit have, about- We have one more question. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, right. Will the trust fund cover MSMSD? I can't answer that question. You'll have to ask the trust fund if you put it in your- a sampling plan, you know, I would recommend you turn that question possibly 
to your UST team leader. I, I can't speak for the trust fund. All right. They, I do know that they tell you in their letters that uh, please include the appropriate QAQC. So, but speak to your UST team leader or your trust fund representative. Okay. All right. Now what's- I've been stumped. Okay. All right. So we're now on to what's new and what's next section. We've talked a little bit about problems and that's kind of depressing and a bummer. So let's talk about uh, some upcoming things, some new things, some new technologies. What's different in the world of sampling since I started it back in 1992? Um, well, there's a, we, we have a recap for one thing, and that came along some time ago. We've been working for a long time under our current recap regulation, which is the 2003 version, and that is the regulatory promulgated version. We all have to follow that. That is not uh, my, uh, optional. That is the current legal uh, version. Now, the Recap Corrective Action Group, or CAG, of which I mentioned I'm a member, we've been working on a long overdue update. I feel like I've been working on this for 10 years, and I probably have, uh, to the Recap 2003 regulation. Well, to the various things, you know, um, different administrations, and most recently COVID, and we haven't been able to get that uh, update out. It has to be promulgated through a you know, legal process because it is a regulation. We do have our proposed update viewable on the remediation recap webpage. We have that out there as what we had for an informal comment period. Also, because, hey, we got nothing to hide. It's out there. That's what we intend to do. Um, and you can look at it if you like to. However, we cannot use it until it's promulgated. This is where we intend to go. And uh, we'd like to, uh, you know, be upfront with y'all on that. But at this point, it is uh, it is just up there for your information and edification and enlightenment. All right. So this update uh, to recap, uh, I, I quit even calling it by a, a year name. I don't know. Uh, we are hoping to propose it after the COVID nineteen pandemic related issues have passed, and we're kind of getting there. And if all goes well in the promulgation process. It'll become final no more than one year after proposal. I say that if all goes well, because that's the law. If, it, if we can't get it out in a year, we have to start over and promulgate it again. So it, it will take somewhere between generally four months, and that's not likely, to a year. And uh, so that's a legal process we have to go through before we can use the proposed update. All right, next slide, Rebecca. Okay, and before we go to the oh. next I just want to note Tad uh, Loop with our uh, UST group. Uh, yep. commented, the trust fund reimburses for samples included in the 2.4 QAQC list. Um, okay. Included. Thank you, Tad. Um, I appreciate that. I didn't want to say that with that. But yeah, the MSMSD from the site is included in the 2.4 list. So I believe Tad told us that that, that is uh, reimbursable. There we go. Okay. All right. All right, so I, I even, I, you know, we used to call it recap, I think it's even called recap 2019, which is kind of a joke on the uh, website because it didn't happen, but I just call it recap next now, but it, as it's currently drafted, I want to give you, you know, I'm familiar with it, recap appendix B is in there, uh, if you want to read it, uh, you can see what we propose. And it won't change much concerning soil sampling because, you know, we have a good process, it works very well, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, we talked about co-located borings before just being kind of a policy thing, uh, and we intend to specifically list them in Appendix B to say, hey, you know, if you don't do continuous sampling, you can propose a co-located boring, and that would have to be an approved site investigation work plan. The default is still continuous sampling. That is the best approach. Co-located borings are kind of a, a workaround, but um, again, they will not be approved standard. You'll have to put them in a work plan and then get them approved by DEQ. Uh, next thing is language will be better changed to convey that organic vapor detection instruments other than a PID or FID can be used to screen fuel, fuel samples. So, you know, we, we mentioned a PID, we mentioned an FID, but there are other instruments out there and we want to make sure we're maximally inclusive. You know, if you uh, want to use another type of instrument and it can do the work fine. We're, we don't want to limit it to, you know, 1990s instrumentation. So uh, you know, we're going to kind of tweak that language to make it uh, clear that other instruments are good. 
And then here's a big one, SPLP. We're familiar with that. That's the synthetic precipitation leachate procedure that we have used historically to determine where the soil, the groundwater pathway is complete. So you take your highest concentration sample, you run it for SPLP, and then if it leaches, you know, you have a potential problem. If it doesn't leach, Yahtzee, you're good. It's a closed case, go home. Well, what we found is that this one and none SPLP um, doesn't always work. It's, uh, you know, kind of more complicated than that. Um, there's a couple of things. One is that SPLP measures what's in the soil right now, not what's in the soil at the time of release. So unless you're there when the release occurred, SPLP may not be completely valid. The other thing is, you know, geologists will tell you that soil is heterogeneous and varies across the site. You've got different soil types on your site and you have different concentration of constituents in these uh, soil types, you can have different results. So we're going to require that there be multiple SPLP samples uh, from different soil types and from different concentrations. And then we'll be able to better evaluate that soil to groundwater pathway. So it's actually a pretty good idea to study with SPLP. I'm doing it at my barium site right now. We're looking, we know that we have leaching at a certain concentration, but we're trying to find out the concentration that won't leach so that we can actually go out and remediate what we have to and not what we don't have to. So it can be useful. So get ready to take multiple SPLPs guys and graph them out. So your geologist is gonna have fun. All right, next slide, please. All right, so this is really now. There, a lot of you may not know this, but uh, we do have an equivalent now to the Encore sampler. When EPA method 5035 came along, you had either Encore or Preserve Vials. Well, this um, Encore sampler, you know, is a brand of sampler and other sampling manufacturers, particularly environmental sampling and supply, have wanted to get into that particular market. You know, this is the type of sampler, the Encore or the ESS sampling and supply core in one sampling system. These are the samplers where you go out and plunge the sampler into your soil that you're gonna sample in your tube or um, on your sample table, whatever. And then you put a cap on it. You put that sampler on ice, you get to laboratory within 48 hours and they extract it in the laboratory. Really all EPA method 5035 is vial sampling. It's just who puts it in the vial. With the Encore or the ESS Corn One, um, the laboratory puts it in the vial. You don't have to use a field balance if you use these in the field. The laboratory is going to get the weight to a hundredth of a gram in the laboratory when they extract it. Um, so this um, this is good. The downside, of course, are these are expensive. They uh, cost Encores and Corn Ones uh, cost about the same, somewhere around eight to nine dollars a piece, depending. Uh, on how much bulk you buy. Um, but we have at least an alternative to the Encore now, the ESS or Environmental Sampling Supply Core in One. Now the Core in One is currently accepted by EPA Region 6 as an Encore equivalent sampler. It has been in use by EPA contractors in probably the last five years. The LDEQ currently accepts, you can use it now, the Core in One in place of an Encore sampler. You can use it as an Encore equivalent. LDQ, FAQs, and SOPs have been updated to list the Corn One as an Encore equivalent sampler. So you can use it now. It's been out there, but a lot of people haven't heard about this yet. Um, people are still thinking it's Encore only, but no, Corn One. So next slide, please, Rebecca. This is uh, a picture shamelessly stolen from the ESS website. Uh, we don't have rocks like that in Louisiana that often. I bet that's up in Minnesota where they're from. But regardless, this is the Corn One sampler system. Now, you see on the right, there is a Corn One sampler with its cap on, and it's on this green handle, uh, kind of a blue green, really. It's kind of pukey colored. I don't know why they use that plastic, but that's their thing. Um, but the, this is the great thing. Now, if you guys have a field team that loses stuff all the time, you know, the corn one is for you because that, that plastic handle there cost about nine bucks. All right. You know, those stainless steel Encore handles that you put the Encore sampler on to shove in the dirt. Well, those things used to cost over a hundred dollars. So, you know, you can afford to lose a lot more $9 handles than you can hundred dollar handles before you have to fire your sampling team. Um, so, you know, if you got those kind of people, 
that might be the better sampler for you. Now in the left bottom, you see the, on, the corn one, sorry, with dirt in it. And it's got this little cap off of it. That shows, you know, they've already plunged that corn one into the soil and they have a cap now. The other thing about the corn one, it doesn't require a special tool at the laboratory to extract the sampler. You just take off the backside of the sampler and push down on a little plunger with your finger. So you don't really need a tool to extract. Now at the top left of the screen, you see one of the little corn ones, it's a little bag from ESS. And that's how you send it to the laboratory. You put the sampler in the bag and you put it on ice, just like the Encore. So, except you don't have that metal um, foily bag. So, but that's a corn one. You can use it now in place of the Encore. All right. I think we have a question, Rebecca. Maybe. Uh, yes. Can I okay. Cut that later. Uh, I seem to remember it before. Is LDEQ considering allowing EPA 5035A like TCEQ has done? We'll discuss that in just a minute. That's upcoming. All right. Okay. Okay. So talking about what's new and what's next, let's move away from that for a moment to talk about sonic drilling. Boy, have we had a lot of discussion on sonic drilling lately. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, sonic drilling, it's a newer method of drilling and it's really popular for installing monitoring wells. Boy, you can blow and go and put a well in with this stuff. It's great stuff. Um, however, um, it has significant issues with regard to soil sampling. If you operate your sonic rig uh, you know, in a, a high sonic condition, with a lot of water flow, you can heat and sonically disrupt the soil, and that destroys your volatiles and your light in semi volatiles. Yeah, so I have, I'll talk about it when I look at the picture, but yeah, you get a sort of a hot slurry out of these things, and that's not good. Now, sonic and heat, if those of you that are a little bit familiar with lab stuff, maybe familiar with the old method. Uh, 8015, you know, this is where we get TBH, G, D, and O, the EPA method. Well, if you're going to measure the diesel and the oil range, you take the sample, which might still have some gasoline in it, and you either heat it or you sonicate it to drive off those volatiles so that you can then measure your diesel and your gas range. So it's a proven method of destroying volatiles is sonication. Now, initially, EPA Region 6 and DEQ said we should not obtain volatile soil samples from sonic borings. Just should not do it. No sonic, no volatile. What EPA did was they would go in there first and geoprobe uh, using direct push technology, and then they'd use sonic to only put in wells. They would go get their volatile samples from a geoprobe and then do sonic. But things have changed a little bit. So next slide, please, Rebecca. All right, so we, if you're not familiar with this, here's another take home message, a little bonus for you. The green book, the, the environmental bullhorns and monitoring system book that we've had since 2000 is in the process of update and has been since last April, not this April, but last April. Um, this is the DNR DQ guidance, and it's going to be incorporated by reference into the Title 56 uh, regulations. So it will be like recap. It won't just be a good idea. It will be a regulation too. But uh, they're going to bring in this guidance manual and they've asked for comments for over a year. And we have their response to comments are available over at the LDNR webpage. So if you want to look at that, uh, we can. Now, based on the comments about sonic drilling and volatile issues, uh, the following text is what is in their response to comments and they say will be in the final version. So you're hearing it here first, guys. This is new information. It's out there. This is what they're going to put in the guidance manual. So it says, depending on the soil type, the typical sonic core may retain a nearly complete soil column that is representative of soil stratigraphy, but does not typically result in undisturbed soil sample. Now, I will say that in this New document, undisturbed soil sample is when we're going to take samples from it. We want undisturbed soil samples. That's a term they use a lot. Okay. So that's when you take volatiles, you want an undisturbed soil sample. 
So it says, do both the method for core advancement and extrusion. Soil samplers and techniques that recover undisturbed soil samples may be used with sonic equipment. Now, I'm not a sonic expert. Um, I have talked to some, and they tell me that they can push tools in front of the sonic to take undisturbed soil samples. So good, that, that would be okay. If you can push a, a tube in front of your sonic, uh, before you drill with that and you can get an undisturbed soil sample, then great. We can sample an undisturbed soil sample with Sonic. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so this is back to the guidance um, text. It says, however, unless specific tools or techniques are used, Sonic drilling can result in soil cores that are heated and reduced to a slurry, resulting in the destruction or loss of volatile organic compounds, VOC, or semi volatile organic compounds or VOC. Consequently, in sampling for VOC or semi-VOC, drillers must seek approval from the ARA. Now, ARA, that's an undefined term, but I was cutting and pasting directly from the text. They define it elsewhere, but that is appropriate regulatory authority. So if you're doing a DQ job, you need to get approval from the appropriate regulatory authority. So again, an approved work plan on a case-by-case -case basis and or consider guidance on using rotary sonic techniques found in EPA's design and installation monitoring wells, that's the cited thing, to ensure that soil cores are not heated or disturbed. Now, I have been told that you can run sonic equipment in such a way that you don't end up with a hot slurry at the end. So, you know, depending on your soil type and everything else, we want those undisturbed samples. We don't want the volatiles uh, destroyed because we've got to you know, take those into recap and figure out whether they're a risk or not, you know. So we need to measure them accurately. All right, next slide. So looking at uh, Sonic, I wanted to show you all Sonic rig. This was used at the Everwood Evangeline Superfund site over in Evangeline by Jennings. And this is a crescent drilling. They have a rig here that's track mounted rig, Sonic drilling rigs on the right and their support vehicles on the left. And they are installing a Sonic uh, boring there. We've already, in this case, like I said, EPA went in there first and they went and did a geopro boring. And so we already got our volatiles. That's the geologist on the left over there has already, she's just looking at the samples that come out for geological reasons. We've already assumed, uh, us, you know, taken our volatile samples from this particular thing using a classic DPT. All right, so that's a sonic rig, if you haven't seen one. It's February in this picture. And one of the points, one things I point out in February is when these cores came out of the ground and they got laid out over there for the, the geologists to look at, they were smoking in the steam, well, steaming really, because they were so hot and they just come out as a slush. Now, there's no volatiles that's going to survive that. But again, we didn't care because here we're just putting in a monitoring mode. Okay, next slide, please, Rebecca. Here's another example, this another day um, at the same site, same rig, the geologist is in the foreground, um, looking at dirt, you know, that's what geologists like to do. Uh, but anyway, there's the sonic rig in the background with all its support stuff, uh, making another monitoring well location, so we're installing a well, okay? All right, so there you go, newest information. All right, let's go. We just have uh, another poll question. Just to see where folks are and who's been dealing with sonic drilling. Um, have you used or overseen sonic drilling at a site? Uh, so yes, no, we've explored it, but we haven't actually used it. Or this is the first time I'm hearing about sonic drilling. Um, so we'll give you a few seconds. And uh, for the question that came in about 5035, we're gonna get to that in just the next slide. Um, so we're up to almost 80% of you have voted. All right. We're gonna give you all 10 more seconds to submit your vote. Seems like most of you have submitted in. We're holding steady at 82%. So got three more seconds to submit something. All right. Pulling. All right, so only a few of you have actually uh, used sonic drilling at a site. Um, a couple of you have, have explored it but haven't used it, or and, and several of you, this is the first time you're hearing about it. So good that we could expose you uh, to new stuff. Hey. All right. 
And Keith, I'm going to go to the next okay. for you. All right. So to move on to that issue of EPA method 5035A, um, historically, our position on 5035A was that it was a draft method. It was first drafted in uh, 2002, and it stayed in draft until February 2021. And our position was if we have a promulgated approved method versus a draft method, we use the promulgated approved method. We were using the final method, which is 5035 itself. The draft method was 5035A. Now, validated, EPA quit uh, promulgating SW846 as a regulation. They now are getting into this touchy-feely guidance mode where methods are, are validated. So we have a promulgated method, F method 5035, versus a validated method, which is, is that a lower tier of methodology? What should we do about it? You know, honestly, we're not sure. We got to talk to the corrective action group, anything else. It's only been since February of 2021 that there was an option because it came out of draft form. But, you know, one position is that uh, you should use a final method. You should not use a validated method, whatever that means. But if we take that position, then all the newer methods are just going to be validated, not promulgated. So, yeah. So, anyway, um, that's, that's where we're at. It's, it's really kind of new. Um, it was actually in preparing for this presentation that I found that they changed its, uh, its status in February. So, you know, there we go, research. Um, now, what is 5035A? Well, 5035A will allow you to do what you've been doing all along. You can use encores or corn ones in the field with a 48-hour hold. You can use preserved vials in the field, and you can have a 14-day hold. But the 5035A will allow a third option, a dry vial collection. This is sort of a hybrid between the Encore or Corn One and the Preserve Vials. So what you would do is you have a dry vial, like your Preserve Vials, a 40 milliliter vial, and it is weight checked by laboratory and there's a tear weight on it. And there's no preservative in it. It's like it says, a dry vial. And you in the field put in 4.5 to 5.5 grams, just like you would into a preserve vial. Then you get that dry vial to the laboratory in 48 hours. Okay, so it has a holding time like an Encore or a Core in One. So got, still got a 48 hours. In those 48 hours, the laboratory has to inject the preservative into the vial through the septum. So that, uh, that's where the preservative occurs. Like I told you, you know, everything in a vial is, all this 5035 is really a vial method. It's just where does the vial get preserved? You know, it's a laboratory in the field. So now for us to consider doing 5035A, you know, the regulations require that we can only accept data from a laboratory credited in the method. So if we are to look at 5035A data at all, it has to come from a LELAP accredited laboratory that is accredited in method 5035A. So that's first thing is, you know, I don't know if there are any of those. There might be because we sometimes have reciprocal accreditation with other states. We haven't been allowing 5035 because it's been draft, or 5035A, I'm sorry, because it's been draft. So there hasn't, I don't suspect there's been any kind of local interest in the method. But the thing that we are still trying to figure out, and that's why I put probably in this last bullet point, you know, we know our soil in Louisiana is still heavier than other places. So we are still supposed to put in 4.5 to 5.5 grams. The 4.5 to 5.5 grams, we still believe we should use a field balance. So we're thinking that the field weight check, at least of the soil aliquot, may still be required. Because if you just plunge one of these terra cores or corn ones, not corn ones, excuse me, um, lock and load sampler into the soil and pop it in the vial, 
you're going to have more than the 4.5 to 5.5 grams. Now, in the laboratory, you know, if they could accommodate that, if they could weigh that and adjust their calculations, anything accordingly, that would be great. And maybe that would work. But the problem is your high volume laboratories you deal with now are probably just going to stick a micro syringe through there and shoot five milliliters in there. So you may not have the one-to-one -one ratio you need, you know. Um, they've got 48 hours and they're probably on the timer, you know, trying to get there. So, you know, I don't think they're going to be able to compensate for an overweight sample. Um, if it could be done in the calculation, that'd be great too, but we just don't know enough about it yet. We're going to be talking to, you know, laboratories, anything else. But at this point, if you want to do 5035A, you would have to have a Louisiana Lee Lab accredited laboratory. And I will tell you, you need to do a field weight check just to make sure you're getting the 4.5 to 5.5 grams. Now, one good thing is those laboratory prepared vials aren't going to lose methanol. You know, if they just are a dry vial with weight on it, unless somebody at the laboratory made a mistake writing that weight on it, it's going to be correct. You know, that vial's not going to gain or lose weight on its own. So, but you know, that happens too. We've seen that where laboratory human beings make human being errors in writing that tear weight on a vial. So, you know, but uh, there's some problems with 5035A. I will tell you, we, as DQ uh, sent in comments on the method when it was still in draft form. We, you know, formally comment on the method. We point out errors in the method. You know, one of the, some of the errors that were corrected by EPA's clarification of method 5035 in 1997, they made the same errors in 5035A in 2002. We called these errors to their attention. We formally made comments on it. And guess what? They published those errors in February, 2021. They tell you in the field that you have to weight check vials to a hundredth of a gram. And, you know, in the EPA's clarification of 5035, they said, oh, that was a typo. We meant a tenth of a gram. And they go into detail about that. Well, they made the same error in 5035A because nobody cared enough to, you know, check that out. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, if you really want to do this, put it in a work plan because there's no other way that uh, at this point I would suggest that you you do it. All right. So that's, uh, that's it. Do we want to do questions? At our, what do we got next? Rebecca, next slide real quick. Yeah, we're going to finish up the presentation and then um, talk about sonic drilling a little bit more. Okay. All right. Next slide then. All right. So the, now let's talk about the future. Um, we talked about what's new, but what, what's coming down the road? What can we expect to see in the future? So I want to kind of share with you this really interesting thing with Superfund Research Program. If you've never heard of this, here's another take-home message. Go subscribe to their newsletter. They have great information where they're taking the latest information in toxicology and environmental research and putting it together uh, and putting it out in summaries. So one of their research briefs 243 is called Detecting Environmental Chemicals with Novel Immunoassay Technology. Now, that sounds exciting, doesn't it? Now, I'm going to try to get all these uh, acronyms right, so bear with me. But the device in question uses what's called a lab on a chip, which is an LOC platform. And this is originally from medical testing that this is where this came from. And it's to perform a microscale enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, that's ELISA, that's a nice acronym, I'd hate to say that more than once. Anyway, ELISA, it's a popular lab technique that is designed to use antibodies to measure a specific substance in a sample. And like I said, this is primarily medical laboratory stuff, but we're seeing it adapted perhaps for us to use in the field in the near future. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the device itself consists of a handheld microcontroller, which is powered by your smartphone. See, that's why I said there's an app for that. The microcontroller has a printed circuit board designed to perform these ELISA operations and contains a slot in which the user can insert a chip specific to the chemical being detected. So, you know, with one of these devices, theoretically, you could have your benzene chip, maybe your xylene chip or whatever constituents you're working with so that you can measure different ones in the field 
and end up with something that is either quantitative or semi-quantitative. So this is some great stuff. All right, next slide. This is uh, from the actual research brief. This shows a uh, elderly model of iPhone there because it's got still has touch ID. And then we see the Elias on a chip um, system here that uh, talks about the smartphone, the microcontroller with chip slot that you put in there to measure a specific thing and the ELISA on a chip. The smartphone powers the microcontroller but is also used to record an image of the ELISA reaction. So if you had a certain chemical reaction, say or whatever, you could uh, have that recorded either through the app or take a picture of it. So you have data. But anyway, that's, uh, that's some research from UC Davis. But anyway, all right, so that is uh, possible in the near future that we'll have some uh, from field testing that is uh, far better than our just typical immunoassay tests. Okay, now next slide, please. But in the far future, we'll have the tricorder. And if you ever watch Star Trek, Mr. Spock can use that to tell you anything. You know, Captain, there is benzene, or whatever. But anyway, live long and prosper. All right, one final poll. Uh, let's bring this up. There we go. All right. This is honestly just to make sure that you are still with us at the end of the webinar. So, what series featured the tricorder? Was it on Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, Battlestar Galactica, or you don't know, but you really did stay on to the end? That is an acceptable answer. Again, we just need you to answer the poll questions to document that you uh, were with us the whole time. Uh, we had a question come in. Uh, somebody uh, missed one of the poll questions. If you just miss one of them, you'll still receive a certificate of attendance. Um, we're just trying to see that you were there the majority of the time. Um, so we're going to give you a little bit more time. And um, Keith, can you, uh, while we're waiting for the uh, poll results, can you talk a little bit more? We had um, folks that wanted to know more about sonic drilling. Yeah. Um, well, again, uh, sonic drilling um, will be allowed for semi-volatile and volatile sampling under the new LDNR um, manual, which is currently about to be issued. Um, but special tools or techniques will be required if you're going to collect semi-volatile or volatile samples. And it's advised that you obtain uh, permission from the appropriate regulatory authority for whatever methodology you intend to um, employ to ensure that your samples are not uh, heated or sonicated. So they're not destroyed, they're, they're undisturbed. That's the key word from the guidance document. So there are some tools you can push in front of the sonic. Uh, they're basically you know, like a geoprobe tube, uh, so basically DPT-like. And then after you push that, got your core, then you can sonic uh, on at, uh, you know, your leisure. Or you can operate the sonic in such a way as to result in those undisturbed cores that are not heated and not converted to slurry. That's what the LDNR and LDQ handbook will allow. So we came to that, I guess, uh, decision about that. I made comments on volatiles, uh, others did as well. And that's the compromise. You can use Sonic, but you have to use it with special tools or techniques if you're going to sample volatiles or semi-volatiles. If you're sampling metals, who the heck cares, huh? You know, <laughs> blow and go. But, um, you know, if you're going to sample an organic compound that can be broken down by the drilling technique, then you have to adjust your technique. Okay. Um, Keith, related to that, uh, somebody asked, how does sonic drilling work? So what are, what are the mechanics of sonic drilling? How does it, what is it, how does it actually work? Well, the, it's, it's often, it's really like a DPT, okay, but it has a very long core barrel, if you will. The ones I saw are about 10 foot long, you know. Um, and what they do is that they use a sonic uh, rig to sonicate the barrel. So the barrel is 
vibrated by sound waves, if you will, right? And so it, uh, it is, it, as it goes through the soil, it knocks the soil out of the way by these vibrations, right? You know, in our old geoprobe, we say old geoprobe, I remember when they first rolled them out in the 90s, you know, but, you know, we're all used to geoprobes now, and you use hydraulic hammers, you know, you to force it through the soil. Well, sonic vibrates that 10-foot tube at possibly ultrasonic vibrations. When you hear it, it goes, Meow. you know, it's kind of like that. Um, you didn't know you're going to get sound effects, did you? But anyway, as they push this in the ground, the sonication vibrates that tube. There's also water. So in a way, it's like our old, you know, water rotary rigs and that water is used along with the sonication to break up the soil matrix and allow them to push through um, to put in wells or whatever. They're very good. You know, you got these long sands, you know, over in Southwest Louisiana. Those of you over there in that area know you hit the upper sands of Chico. And it's difficult to keep going with the geoprobe because the friction of that sand and so forth, uh, just, you know, you, you hit a, you hit a, what, what you drillers call denial, right? Geologists, drillers call denial. Just can't push a geoprobe deeper than a certain level because of all the friction on that. Well, between the water and the vibration, this sonic tube is able to be pushed by the hydraulics through stuff that would jam your geoprobe. You'd just hit, you'd hit a stop. So you can go deeper, you can go faster. And, uh, but the problem is why you do that, you go hotter and you convert, convert the stuff on the inside of the tube to a slurry. Now, if you run it, in lower sonication levels. Now, I'm not a driller, so don't ask me how to set it. But if you run it lower and don't, you know, push as hard or as fast and uh, not put as much water, that's what I was told, then you can get an undisturbed sample out of it. So I'm taking all the drillers and experts that went into that geotechnical handbook at their word and that it is possible. And again, also you can push a tube in front of it. You can sonic down, then pull everything up push your DPT tube down in front of it, get your undisturbed sample, and then sonic down another interval, and then do that again. So those are options. All right. Um, we also have a question. Can a tricorder be used for sample analysis now? And will it no, be? No, not now, recap? sadly. <laughs> sadly, no. Um, you know, I guess you'd have to not propose yet. that in a work plan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, does the tool used with the sonic drill to collect volatiles collect consolidated samples? Well, if you're using like a DPT tube, uh, my understanding is it will result in an undisturbed sample core. So it's just like a geoprobe tube uh, in that case. So it's uh, it would be, you know, you can collect an undisturbed sample with special tools. It's what I'm informed. Okay. That is all the questions that have come in before. Uh, just in case folks have additional questions, I'm gonna share the results. So please feel free, keep sending those questions if you have them. Um, as I suspected, most of the folks on the call are Trekkies or at least um, are familiar with Star Trek, uh, which is where it featured the tricorder. Um, but thank y'all for everybody answering. And then let's see, share the results. There you go. Awesome. And then I'm going to go ahead and put up uh, Keith's inf contact information in case you have questions after this. Um, sure. yep. uh, and then again, you know, last chance, put in questions for here, either in the chat, the Q&A, or uh, if you are brave enough, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you if you'd like to ask something verbally. And while we're having our last chance for questions, I also wanted to point out um, these are our upcoming trainings. Did I do this? Yes, June. 8th. All right. So next we have Back to Basics with June Sutherland, kind of a, a recap 101 of the, the basics of uh, the Risk Evaluation Corrective Action Program. Uh, then Keith will be coming back in August to talk about developing an effective sampling plan. Uh, then Jennifer Schatzel will be talking about the Voluntary Remediation Program uh, in September. As Keith mentioned, um, it does BRP regular uh, investigations also conform to RECAP. 
um, but they require some additional sampling and some additional considerations for the assessment part of it. Uh, and then there are some flex, more flexibility when it comes to the, the cleanup to do partial cleanups for non-responsible parties. So you wanna hear about those options and kind of the benefits of, of that program. And then in October, um, June Sutherland will be coming back and talking about common mistakes, misconceptions, and compliance issues with the recap, specifically more with the uh, recap analysis part, um, the book stuff once you get the, the results back. Um, and as I mentioned, the recording and the PowerPoint will be available after the webinar. Um, give me a couple of weeks to put it on the LDEQ YouTube page and to send out the certificates of um, attendance or post the course credit if you are an LDEQ employee. Um, if you wanna register for any of these webinars and you don't have that information already, um, shoot me an email at rebecca.audi at la.gov and I will send you over the webinar flyer um, so you can register for each of those webinars as well. All right, so uh, we have a question. When will groundwater sampling be covered in an upcoming training? Uh, that will probably be sometime next year. Uh, we are working on that. We kind of developed our initial list and, um, and then we're kind of looking forward to 2022. Um, that is definitely something when, uh, that does remind me. When you exit this webinar, a survey will pop up to give us some feedback on how helpful these webinars are. One of the questions is what would you like to see in upcoming trainings? Um, so definitely put in your suggestions on what else you would like to see. Um, and we, we can add that to the list for, uh, for topics for next year. All right, any additional questions? I'm not seeing anything else in the Q&A uh, or in the chat. So um, Keith, again, I just wanted to thank you so much uh, for taking the time to put this presentation together and to give it this morning. We really appreciate you sharing your experience and your expertise um, to make sure you're on the same page for recap investigations. Um, our goal with this webinar series with the Brownfields program, you know, we wanna see uh, those sites be put back into reuse quickly. Um, so we're doing the series to help facilitate that investigation process, you know, help reduce the amount of time you're going back and forth with DEQ on trying to get things right. Um, so hopefully this series will help uh, facilitate that process and answer some of your questions up front. All right, and with that, I don't think I see anything else. Keith, is there anything else you would like to share or add? Uh, no, thank you very much for attending the webinar and putting up with me for this long. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions that you think of later, um, feel free to email me or call me at my desk number, but don't call me at my desk number today because I'm not at my desk. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> if you do leave a message, I'll get back to you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay.